Few bands embodied the pure excess of the 70s, like music legends Queen. Embracing the exaggerated pomp of programme rock and heavy metal, as well as music hall, the British quartet delved deeply into camp and bombast, creating a huge, mock operatic sound with layered guitars and overdubbed vocals. Queen's music was a bizarre yet highly accessible fusion of the macho and the fay. For years, their albums boasted the motto, no synthesizers were used on this record, signalling their allegiance with legends of post-Led Zeppelin hard rock bands. These were four students who'd met in Kensington Market or somewhere like that. And um, two of them had been in a group called Smile, which never really did anything. But it had obviously laid a foundation for, the, for what they were going to do with Queen. I mean, Queen is, is definitely a, a, a name which suggests a certain element of uh, homosexuality and all the rest of that which uh, I'm sure in certain cases like Freddie Mercury was quite justified but with the others I don't think it was justified at all I think they're perfectly normal chaps you know one of the curious things about Freddie Mercury was that he seemed to be uncertain about the fact that he was of Asian African origins uh, and his real name was Frederick Balsara. I think he was, he, he felt a little like um, a foreigner even though he was extremely English to, to meet him. He, he, he spoke very well um, but he was an outrageous person who wore peculiar clothes and was an arty type. Um, it's not one of those uh, meetings that you think, oh, I'll remember that forever. It, it was just fairly inconsequential. I, I never interviewed him. I, I did interview Brian May and Roger Taylor and found them both very pleasant, very um, civilized and well-spoken and well-educated, because Brian May is actually an expert on some kind of astronomy, something about dust on in the solar system or something like that. Because he went to uh, Imperial College in London and was um, doing a degree, and had Queen not uh, become so successful, he would certainly have become something like Patrick Moore which is an interesting thought. I'm sure that Patrick Moore doesn't play the guitar quite like that. As all four members completed college, they simply rehearsed, playing just a handful of gigs. By 1973, they had begun to concentrate on their career. I was in the EMI offices on the day that Queen was signed, and uh, I always remember there had been this talk in the office about we've, we're going to sign this band called Queen and they're, they're going to be huge and they're outrageous and they're all pomp and you know, they're this and they're that and we were all thinking, hmm, okay. And then the band came in and they had like this enormous entourage with them that, and I always thought, bloody hell, they must be huge. This is an unsigned band and they've got this massive entourage. Of course, it means nothing, it's just hangers on, but... And they've got... Like, Freddie had this big cape, and, and he was also gorgeous, and, uh, and you thought, whoa, bloody hell, this is really different. This is very odd. And we put out the single, Seven Seas of Rye, and absolutely nobody got it, and, uh, and just died a death. And everybody was gutted. And it's the one thing that I always remember at EMI, that they were like a dog with a bone. They wouldn't let it go. And that's what's missing with a lot of companies now. You put a single out, it doesn't go, band's history, flushing. 
They released that probably three times before it was a hit. And eventually it became a hit. And then the album became a hit after that. And then of course they ended up becoming one of the biggest, biggest grossing bands of all time. And we had one monster, monster hit after another. I got the first Queen album and thought well, it was all right. And then a second album and there was a song on there called Seven Seas of Rye, and it was only a short ex excerpt from it. Um, and I thought this was quite interesting. They were trying to do something a bit different here. And then the third album came out, and suddenly uh, there was a track called Killer Queen. And this was such an obvious hit that y you began to see what they'd been building towards. You know, they, they came to the height with Bohemian Rhapsody. Night of the Opera and Day of the Races, I still think, are their best, particularly Night of the Opera with the likes of Year of 39, where, you know, one of the only tracks where Brian May sings on, which is absolutely great, but no one actually knows of it. And the same with uh, Roger Taylor with I'm in Love With My Car. You know, the, those parts really sort of sell Queen of the 70s. We got Bohemian Rhapsody, which was an epic track, which topped the chart for eight weeks or something like that over one Christmas, about 74 or 5, I think. And, um, Suddenly Queen were in the, the Premier League and were taken a lot more seriously and people started listening back to what they'd done before. According to many reports, it was the most expensive rock record ever made at the time of its release. The first single from the record, with Bohemian Rhapsody, became Queen's signature song. Their records were almost instant hits for most of the time and they were one of the first acts who were very keen on video as a medium for promoting themselves and they um, they put out a number of very early videos I mean I, I always feel that uh, Bohemian Rhapsody was one of the milestones in rock video and it was watchable more than once, which is usually the problem with music videos, that once you've seen it, you really don't need to see it again because you remember it. They continued to pile up hit singles in both Britain and America over the next five years, as each of their albums went into the top ten, always going gold and usually platinum in the process. There was an anthemic quality about many of their songs um, and it was tinged with an outrageous ability to um, headline grab. For example, there was um, they did a song called Bicycle Race and another one called Fat Bottom Girls which were the two sides of a single. And in order to shoot a video for this, they hired a Wimbledon Stadium or somewhere like that, and they got a lot of young, nubile young ladies who rode bicycles naked around this stadium. After the Bohemian Rhapsody video, which was a, a fantastic thing with um, all those voices going around, I'm sure everybody who is watching this may have seen the Bohemian Rhapsody video because it was just, first of all, very long. It was about six and a half minutes, I think. And it had so much early video trickery, which, if, which now we, we take for granted. But it, it was really breaking down the barriers in terms of how you could portray a rock group on television and keep it interesting. Queen shot one of the first conceptual music videos. But if you made a, mo a movie, you can show it all around the world simultaneously and it doesn't cost anything to uh, promote your artist. Whereas if you have to go and tour, it's a very complicated and expensive business and relies a lot on the good health of the artist involved. So I'm sure Queen thought the ABBA were the same. If we make a video, we don't have to tour because people can see us and we'll be on the television, all right? 
So, yes, I think they were one of the first artists who were designed for video rather than for live performance, although they certainly could perform live very well. When you go as far as the 1980s and, you know, Innuendo being their last great album and a lot of stuff on the Maiden Heaven that appears, that Freddie was actually coming into his own again, you know, would have been in the 90s. But they carried on and on and on and um, they kept having hits and Freddie Mercury became more and more ill and ultimately it became clear that he was not going to be able to survive for too much longer. So they made a final album which sold in massive quantities, of course, because by that time they were the darlings of record buyers all over the world. He died, sadly, I think it was sometime about 1995, I can't really remember precisely, and they had a a tribute concert at Wembley Stadium, which was an, an incredible event. It almost equaled Live Aid, I think. Vocalist Freddie Mercury brought an extravagant sense of camp to the band, pushing them towards kitschy humour and pseudo-classical arrangements, as optimised in their best-known song, Bohemian Rhapsody. Freddie was a flamboyant bisexual, he managed to keep his sexuality in the closet until his death from AIDS in 1992. Nevertheless, his sexuality was apparent throughout Queen's music, from their very name to their veiled lyrics. It was truly bizarre to hear gay anthems like We Are The Champions turn into celebrations of sports victories. That would have been impossible without Freddie, one of the most dynamic and charismatic frontmen in rock history. Queen's legacy was that they wrote a lot of original songs which obviously captured the spirit of, of the time in the 80s and 90s. Um, and you still hear Queen records regularly played all the time. Records like Radio Gaga, which the uh, audience had a little dance that they did and seeing them, seeing this happen when you were in, in an audience watching Queen, seeing all these people standing up and jumping about in a particular rhythm, it was quite obvious that they had created something far bigger than they could ever have imagined. But they were launched initially as a heavy metal band and, and kind of crossed over into really a pop band but they were the one pop band that probably did the best heavy metal concerts of all time. Um, it was thought of as glam rock at the time, which was all that um, Bowie, Bolan, Gary Glitter, because they came, that's when they emerged during that era. But um, they weren't particularly glam rock. As I say, I, I think they were just a rock band. I mean, they were, unbelievable live with the, the enormous crown with the smoke and the going up in the air and the band coming out it was spinal tap multiplied by 10 they were fantastic and uh, my undying memory of them is being backstage at Wembley on the day John Lennon died they were doing their show that night and they just heard about John Lennon being killed and, uh, and I'd only heard about it on the way to the show. And uh, we were, I mean, in this hideous underground dungeon that they laughingly call a dressing room at, at Wembley. And all you could hear from upstage, upstairs was from the crowd. And it was, it was making the whole building shake. It was the most, or even the band were kind of choked. It was just the most awesome thing. And of course that's the, the song that they came out and did as their, their opener. Um, and a, a few songs in, they stopped the show and came to the front and announced about John Lennon dying. And then Freddie and um, the guitarist stood at the front and 
did a John Lennon song. I, I believe it was Imagine. I was so choked. I mean, it was just one of those rock and roll moments where you think, oh, holy shit, this is a, a little piece of kind of rock and roll history. Yeah. And you're <laughs> a, a minuscule part of it. You're just kind of getting a snapshot of it. Their first national tour was, I, as I remember, the, the other act on the bill, it was a double-headed thing, was Mott the Hoople. Queen learnt quite a lot from Mott the Hoople about writing a chorus that everybody could punch the air. I, th I think Queen were a, a very, very impressive and important band. Because Queen embraced such mass success and adoration, they were scorned by the rock press, especially when it came to represent all of the worst tendencies of the old guard in the wake of punk. And it became clear that Brian May was an extraordinary guitarist um, and that Freddie Mercury was a great showman. I saw them live two or three times and it was a, an incredibly impressive show. No expense had been spared, obviously. The sound was fantastic. The, it was a spectacular thing, particularly when Brian May was playing. He had a some sort of uh, foot pedal that would enable him to play in harmony with himself an infinite number of times. So he would play da 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 da, uh, and it, it could be repeated and repeated and repeated. And he'd keep playing it, and it, it eventually became extraordinarily powerful and you couldn't forget it. And they were particularly big, I believe, in South America, where they were one of the first Western acts to perform. They did incredibly well in South America, and then they started playing in, Ameri in North America, and became very, very big. The other thing where Queen became a in huge international stars was Live Aid. They played an incredible set at Live Aid um, and zillions of people around the world saw it and suddenly Queen were elevated up another step. It's pretty much after Live Aid which was the first time they've been seen out in this country for quite some time after being ostracised because they um, had done the Sun City gigs in South Africa and no one wanted to actually put any shows there on. That was pretty much around the time they just finished the Works album and done, you know, released Radio Gaga, got to number two in 1984. So, you know, that one gig put them back on the map. Faced with their decreased popularity in the US and waning popularity in Britain, Queen began touring foreign markets, cultivating a large, dedicated fan base in Latin America, Asia and Africa, continents that most rock groups ignored. In 1985, they returned to popularity in Britain in the wake of their show-stopping performance at Live Aid. There's no profit to be made. I mean, that's not the idea at all. I mean, it's impossible to make a profit. Um, I don't know whether we'd even break even. Maybe we will. Um, but that's not the reason we're doing it anyway. There's a tremendous feeling of sort of, uh, I suppose, job satisfaction is a, a strange way to put it. It's quite good to get job satisfaction after 14 years. Well, it's a pretty good job, isn't it? You know, Budapest is going to see us the first time. So you look at it as the beginning of your friendship with, with Hungary and with Budapest, and it, it may last long, as long as Queen will last. If I'm still alive, I will come back. You know? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Right. It's a great experience, and I think it will open the eyes of uh, a lot of uh, uh, people who are working on the show. No. English and Americans, you know, because they, yeah. they have, well, sometimes they have sort of preconceived idea yeah. of what it might be like. By 1991, Queen had drastically scaled back their activity, causing many rumours to circulate about Freddie Mercury's health. On November 23rd, he issued a statement confirming he was stricken with AIDS. He died the next day. The following spring, the remaining members of Queen held a memorial concert at Wembley Stadium, which was broadcast to an international audience of more than one billion. Featuring such great artists as David Bowie, 
Elton John, Annie Lennox, Def Leppard and Guns N' Roses. The concert raised millions for the Mercury Phoenix Trust, which was established for AIDS awareness. The concert coincided with a revival of interest in Bohemian Rhapsody, which climbed to number two in the US and number one in the UK, in the wake of his appearance in Mike Myers' comedy, Wayne's World. Following Mercury's death, the remaining members of Queen were fairly quiet. Brian May released his second solo album, Back to the Light, in 1993, ten years after the release of his first record. Roger Taylor cut a few records with The Cross, which he had been playing with since 1987, while Deacon essentially retired. Queen just became this huge icon group. They never changed their personnel in their entire career, which is quite significant really, because most acts do. But they, they hung together and each of them did little bits of solo work. The problem was that their record label would obviously have liked them to continue and to capitalize on this huge publicity. But without Freddie Mercury, there was an, a sort of vital element missing. It's the, it's the thing about, can you reform the Beatles? Well, you obviously can't now. But, and Freddie Mercury was irreplaceable, I would say. The only possible person might have been Elton John, because he is also a fantastic performer who has been a, a star for 35 years. But then perhaps Elton John wouldn't have wanted to sing Queen's songs, as he writes some pretty good ones himself. When one of your greatest assets uh, is seen to be in bad health and it is unlikely they will recover, it of course um, may, makes a great deal of difference to the record labels with whom they're working. I think the whole the, the history of, of rock and roll music, which is now about 50 years long, whenever there's a gap, it is filled by somebody. But I don't think the specific gap that Queen left has ever has yet been um, filled. <laughs> It's great for us to find a new creative outlet because, you know, without Freddie, the horizon does become quite limited and it's, it's hard to find channels for the, uh, for the catalogue as, as we have it and for our creativity. So this is a very good place for us to be at the moment. The, the songs are all Queen hits. No, there are not new songs in, in this production. They're all the Queen hits, but they're all restructured, reworked, and that's been part of the joy because Number one, you go back in and you find out all the stuff that was in the original songs, all the, the, the arrangement, the structure, the harmonies, the sounds, etc. Then the, the joy is to take that to a new place and reconstruct the song in a new situation so that it becomes germane to the plot. So the plot and the songs have been evolving over the last few weeks and to the point where it's very much a, um, a seamless whole by now. That's WH. There's been many different script ideas that we've looked at along the way. Um, the beginning was that we, we, we looked at the autobiographical approach and pursued it for a long time um, and it just became something which didn't work for us for various reasons um, and then Ben came up with this unbelievable idea for things which happen in the future and we, we just thought this is the perfect vehicle so the thing really started to take off from about midway through last year when we got Ben's script I just felt Queen's music is uniquely theatrical. I mean, it's shot through with wit and grandiose, you know, pomp and ceremony. And I felt that, you know, nothing could be better for the live stage. But I think a story, a story needed to be as big as the music itself. He was a very theatrical character. 
And uh, whilst we're trying to make this not like anything else in the West End, and not a typical musical, not my own favourite kind of uh, entertainment, um, I think Freddie would have absolutely loved it. He was a very theatrical man, and we're using, I think he'd be very pleased what we're doing with his contribution of the music. The three reunited in 1994 to record backing tapes for vocal tracks Mercury recorded on his deathbed. The resulting album, Made in Heaven, was released in 1995 to mix reviews and strong sales, particularly in Europe. Crown Jewels, a box set repackaging their first eight LPs, followed in 1998. So I told my staff we're having a contest. The first prize is you get to keep your job. I want this record on radio stations all across the country. And pow, that was Bohemian Rhapsody. Then, then I met these guys. Four individual kind of odd people. Together, they were Looney Tunes to deal with. But my God, the music they played. I will say as the mayor, of Hollywood, I hereby proclaim this Queen's Day in Pennsylvania. Thank you, thank you. We're very honored, very moved, and uh, we can't wait to be walked on continually. And uh, thanks a lot. It's a great day for us. Thank you for remembering us. This is a great thrill. This is better than a knighthood. <laughs> and uh, I'm looking forward to bringing my grandchildren one day to walk on this star. Thanks, folks. We love you. Ladies and gentlemen, we proudly welcome to the Hollywood Walk of Fame, Queen. I, th I think Queen were a, a very, very impressive and important band, but I don't know whether they have left a, a fingerprint on what has happened since, because there's never been anybody quite like Queen. It's like there's never been anybody like Elvis Presley either, and there's never been anybody quite like the Beatles. The band's popularity rarely waned, even in the late 1980s. The group retained a fanatical following, except in America. In the States, their popularity peaked in the early 1980s, just as they finished nearly a decade's worth of extraordinary popular records. And while those records were never praised, they sold in enormous numbers, and traces of Queen's music could be heard in several generations of hard rock and metal bands in the next two decades. <laughs> 